Medical genetics. That was a long intro. I think our time is up. <laughs> it's great to be here again, and thank you all for coming, and thank you to the uh, wonderful folks at St. Quinney, Brain Foundation, Pramila, and the whole rest of the gang for getting, getting this whole group together. <coughs> um, Dr. Walker and I are going to be giving a, a, a research update of a study that we, uh, we began two years ago. The, um, the study is essentially uh, to, to look at children with established autism who came to me because they had GI symptoms and they were looking for an etiology and a treatment to uh, alleviate their GI symptoms. Uh, standard of care was applied, meaning that nothing different was done with these t to these children in the workup uh, that wouldn't be done to any child that didn't have autism. Um, so a non-invasive workup, blood stool, urine, abdominal x-ray, etc. cetera. Um, and ultimately, ultimately, they uh, pretty much uh, all end up needing uh, a diagnostic endoscopy and a colonoscopy and usually a capsule endoscopy as well. <clears throat> and uh, what's found with these children, uh, the majority of them that come in with a specific group of symptoms, is a intestinal inflammation. It's an inflammatory bowel disease. It's not Crohn's disease, not, not ulcerative colitis. They were treated uh, as we normally treat Crohn's disease. And uh, the question is, A, when you do that, does their, do their GI symptoms improve? And B, is there an improvement in cognition and behavior, and does that cognition and behavior improvement, if it occurs, does it correlate with the improvement in GI symptoms? So that was that's the uh, the background of the study, and and, uh, and um, I don't want to get uh, last year and two years ago uh, when we uh, presented this, uh, I went more into the details of the disease, but in the interest of time. Um, I'm going to go rather quickly through the, the actual disease part so we can get to the data part uh, so we can show you what we've uh, accumulated over the last two years as far as our, our findings. <clears throat> so ASD-associated enterocolitis is basically a unique form of intestinal inflammation that has been documented. I think this is all published data uh, by um, myself, but primarily by others, other research groups. Um, and it's been found in the stomach, small bowel, colon, in children with ASD, but uh, the unique features have not been seen in children uh, without ASD. And again, as far as the uh, listing of the unique features, the, the, the unique cellular and molecular characteristics, we'll get into that just a teeny bit, but I, I don't want to get into that today because I want to leave most of the time today for Steve for the results. Now, the symptoms that these children have, for those of you who are uh, caregivers, are diarrhea, uh, constipation, and this is not typically watery diarrhea, it's more of a semi-formed stool, and the stool is always semi-formed, constipation, uh, which is defined here as um, infrequent stool, but not overly hard stool. It's unusual that they have the overly hard constipation. Abdominal pain, failure to thrive, weight loss, vomiting, food refusal, abnormal stools, meaning the odor, the color, there's a, a sandy content uh, in the stool that we haven't identified yet, food intolerances, those are the main GI symptoms, and the GI symptoms, the parents will often tell you that the GI symptoms are more problematic than the, the autism itself. So those kids who have the, these GI symptoms, um, particularly when it comes out, when it manifests as behaviors, what I didn't put on this list, uh, is that um, extreme of, extremes of behavior by itself may be the only manifestation of an underlying GI disorder, and that's been published as well. Um, and so when it comes to aggression and self-injury, when I hear that a child is having unexplained aggression and self-injury, um, 
then the first thing I think of is a, uh, is a GI flare or an undiagnosed GI disease, uh, particularly the enterocolitis. These are just the endoscopic examples. And I guess uh, as I was sitting through the last couple of days, it struck me that, you know, I, I think a lot of people might like this lecture because um, this is real getting your hands dirty stuff. You know, you, you're in there, this tissue, you can pull it out, you can biopsy it. Um, it's, uh, you know, at least for me, I always, I, I always preferred that kind of, of work uh, as compared to uh, analyzing things um, like um, mitochondria, for example. <laughs> uh, but of course, they're all, they're all equally important and they are, as others have said, they're all pieces of a much larger puzzle. Um, these are endoscopic images uh, on, the upper, on the upper left. Uh, what you see here is um, you see a lack of vasculature. This is not severe colitis. This is not the kind of severe colitis we expect to see with typical ulcerative colitis, but it's an abnormal nonetheless, so it's more of a mild type. What's very prominent is lymphoid hyperplasia. Um, and again, that's a topic in and of itself. Uh, some say it's not pathologic. Uh, it's, that's not true, um, but there's more to be said about that. But again, we can get into each, each one of these slides is a lecture in and of itself. Uh, this is an area of localized colitis of um, lymphocyte and monocyte collection within the colon. And this is an area of ileitis, uh, for those of you familiar with, uh, with GI pathology. And these are types of uh, rather mild findings that we find. They're not the... Um, they're not the intense findings that you would see typically in Crohn's disease or ulcerative colitis. These are capsule endoscopy images of the disease that we're dealing with and studying. And here you see, um, uh, this is an ulceration over here. Here's an area that's, that's a pre-ulcerated area. Yeah, you can see uh, an inflamed nodule with inflammation around it and an area of larger inflammation too. And here's a much larger ulcer. Um, and these are all in the same patient, actually. So it's a good example of how, you know, one lesion can progress to another to progress, to, and it's a, it's, a, it's a progressive disease over time, which is how we see it in general. There's strong clinical, cellular, and molecular evidence that this enterocolitis, that's ASD associated, is fundamentally distinct from Crohn's disease. Uh, yet there's also a, so, um, evidence that there's overlap. And uh, specifically, the, the CD4, CD8 cells, uh, um, their, their density is different. Uh, it's not as intense as you see in Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, but it's more than in normal children uh, who have no disease. Um, there is a unique uh, gamma delta T cell that's not present in classic Crohn's or ulcerative colitis. There's basement membrane thickening. There's, uh, there's IgG deposition at the basolateral membrane. Uh, the epithelium that co-localizes with uh, complement 1Q. So there are a number of different findings that are unique in this disease that are not seen with Crohn's and ulcerative colitis, and we see that demonstrated graphically in this, uh, this PCA um, plot, as you know, of the terminal ileum, and over here you see green are the normal healthy controls, meaning kids who didn't have autism had a bellyache or whatever, somebody scoped them, and uh, this is where they uh, this is where they, they plotted out. Blue is Crohn's disease, purple is the autistic kids, and silver is ulcerative colitis. So what you see is that for the most that the the for the most part, the children with autism uh, localize together with the Crohn's and colitis group, completely separate and apart from the healthy group, and you had also this outlier autism group, which is a separate lecture in and of itself, what we found in that group. And then you have a very similar type of finding when it came to the PCA uh, plot of the colon, where again you see a uh, complete distinction um, between the autistic kids and the healthy kids and overlap 
with uh, autistic kids and the Crohn's and ulcerative colitis. So the immunopathologic nature of ASD is well established. These are all, these are all published data um, by our group and others of these findings. And so the question is, what do I do when I, when I see a kid like this? Um, so because it is, by definition, an inflammatory bowel disease, uh, and there is, um, an, uh, uh, there is a category of IBD that's not Crohn's and not colitis, but unspecified, uh, that's what I choose to call it for the purpose of treatment. And, uh, and I treat them as I treat any other patient with Crohn's disease. And um, I'm sorry, so the second item, so the way I would treat them is again with a combination of corticosteroids, immunomodulators, uh, biologic agents, immune suppressants, anti-inflammatory agents, uh, and dietary therapy. Our experience in general is that the GI symptoms improve over the years. We noticed that the GI symptoms improved or more often than not resolved. And that uh, surprisingly that, that the uh, basic core ASD deficits that they had improved significantly as well. And, uh, and that of course um, was, uh, that's astounding because what that means is that if you have a child with uh, autism and inflammatory bowel disease and you can treat that IBD, then and that means that if the autism symptoms improve statistically as well, then you can make the statement that treating IBD is one way that you can treat autism. Uh, and that's, that's what um, we, we are all waiting to hear. Uh, the current treatment study, I'm gonna leave this to Steve, to Dr. Walker to get into. I just want to add one, one comment before Steve starts, um, is that as far as the GI questionnaires that were used to, uh, to determine if there was improvement, um, we had to construct our own questionnaires because it is my strong belief that the uh, all existing questionnaires uh, do not uh, apply to this patient population who does not talk to you. So all of the all of the subjective information that you want to get from a patient as far as their symptoms and if they, how you know what their symptoms are, if they're getting better, if they're getting worse, um, you don't know. You just don't know. Uh, in, in in fact, the 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 symptom manifestation, the impairment is so is so extreme, I've mentioned this before to somebody, that I've had a number of patients who, when I first met them, t told me that they had a history of a ruptured appendix. And I said, tell me how that presented, like, you know, how did they find out? And in none of the cases did the child ever put their hand on their abdomen to demonstrate pain. It was only a mother who was concerned in each case and insisted that the child not leave the ER without getting a sonogram or a CAT scan because she felt something was wrong in the stomach. Um, that with a low-grade fever with the, with the symptoms. So um, the, uh, the, the questionnaire that we made up was, um, was one that, uh, that I created based upon thousands of patients telling me what their children, what behaviors their children had and um, our trying to determine if those behaviors were actually manifestations of GI symptoms or not. You'll hear more about that now from Dr. Walker. Let's see. Can we get this to uh, presentation mode, maybe? Yeah. Okay, and then, okay, great. Okay, so um, thanks, Arthur, and thank the Brain Foundation for inviting us <clears throat> to be here today. I get to do the exciting part now, or the fun part. I get to tell you about the study and about what we found, and I think it's pretty striking. And by way of a little bit of history, I've been working with Arthur now for about 20 years, and, uh, you know, and, and we, we have a huge tissue bank of, from children he's been treating now for the last 20 years. So we have a bank of about 1,500 patient sets of samples, 20 or 30,000 samples in the bank. And uh, throughout the course of all this time, I'm not a clinician, so I'm asking Arthur all these years, you know, uh, these anecdotally, 
kids get better when they're treated for their GI symptoms. But the question I had being analytically minded is, so who gets better and by how much? And can you predict, you know, who is more likely to uh, show great improvement and all that? Because some of the anecdotal stuff is phenomenal. You treat a child that has been untreated for years with an underlying GI inflammation, and all of a sudden now they have language uh, and things like that. So those are the phenomenological ones. But in general, most kids improve, but not all kids. So the genesis of this study is actually to quantify that in a standard of care setting. And I, I'd like to comment on, that was in the think tank yesterday, I believe, where someone brought up the point, clinicians are in one silo and uh, researchers are in the other silo and never the twain shall meet. My personal strategy is completely opposite. And, and the institute that I work at, the strategy is completely opposite. We go to the clinicians and say, what problems do you have that we can help uh, solve? And I think that's a, a good formula for success here. Okay, so the research question again, I just sort of pointed out, who gets better and by how much when you treat in a standard of care treatment for GI symptoms in kids with autism? And quantitatively, do the GI symptoms get better and by what measure? And do cognition and behavior, because we've known anecdotally that that occurs also, so to what degree does cognition and behavior and what we use as the ASD scales to, to monitor that? So the study design here Arthur does the initial workup. We then enroll the patient if they qualify, and, and uh, roughly 100% of the patients qualify. He, he then begins course of treatment for um, the underlying IBD and tracks the patients for a year. So we get baseline measures before treatment begins, and the baseline measures are going to be looking at two scales. One is the GI symptom scale, and actually there are two individual uh, metrics that I'll talk about, and then also the ASD scales. And the metrics we use there are the ABC, the SRS, and, and Bineman. And these are taken at different time points. Uh, what's interesting and what I protested against, but Arthur insisted on, is these GI symptom scales are actually filled out on a weekly basis. So he has a clinical history. We also have weekly GI questionnaires are being filled out, and then the autism questionnaires are filled out in the standard time frame. So at baseline, um, SRS is filled out at baseline six months and, and 24 or uh, 52 weeks, sorry, yeah, 52 weeks. Uh, SRS is every three months and then the vinyl is before and, and 52 weeks after treatment. So the primary outcome measures are do you have a significant increase or change in the GI, what, what we're calling the GI symptom questionnaire, which is GISS bowel movement chart. Again, this is a um, questionnaire that Arthur developed, and I'll explain what's in that questionnaire in just a second. There's a second and unique um, questionnaire that he developed also that looks at GI externalizing behaviors, which is not part of the standard um, pediatric GI questionnaire. And then we use the three standard autism-related um, metrics. So the GI questionnaire data, um, at this time, at the time we started this, we had, or, or sorry, at the time I presented this earlier this year, we had 11 patients who had completed 52 weeks of therapy and filling out questionnaires weekly. So we had 425 individual bowel movement chart questionnaires that were scored, and we used non-parametric stats to compare and determine if there's significant change from one time point to the other. And for these purposes, a P of 05 was considered significant. So, onto the questionnaire. This, uh, this ASD bowel movement chart questionnaire has 17 questions um, uh, segregated into five subscales, if you will. So questions one through five look at stooling behaviors. Um, questions six through eight, stool characteristics. Nine through 15, frequency of events. Um, question 16 is the Bristol stool chart, and then question 17 is stool characteristics. So we looked at question one through five. I wasn't able to, uh, there's too much data to look at all 52 weeks. So basically what you're looking at is summary data at um, quarterly. So baseline and then um, at 12, 24, 36, and 52 weeks. And we're looking at the change. So a change here, a decrease in the score represents improvement. So for the first five questions on this bowel movement chart questionnaire, you see there's significant change between uh, baseline in the first time point, and then again baseline in the third time point. And on the right is each of the individual plots. 
If we go on to the second set of questions, it's uh, significantly improved at all time points. The question 9 through 15, this subscale, there was not improvement, significant improvement in, in, at any time point. The uh, composite score now for these 11 children, there was significant improvement 12 weeks after uh, initiation of treatment, but then there was improvement at the other three time points, but not, didn't reach the level of significance. But I will point out that in that in initial 11, there was one non-responder. And when you have such a small number and you're looking at so many variables, there, uh, one non-responder can sk uh, skew the results, <coughs> excuse me, and as indicated by if you remove that non-responder, now everything's significant. So in a study with only uh, 11 kids, one uh, outlier can really change the, uh, the overall uh, numbers. The Bristol school, uh, stool chart, between zero and 52 weeks, everybody improved. Um, for the second questionnaire, this is externalizing behaviors. Again, 11 patients. We collected 451 individual questionnaires over the 52 weeks. Three subscales, physical and behavioral signs, extremes of behavior, and abdominal pain. <clears throat> In the first subscale, there was significant improvement at every time point compared to baseline. In the second subscale, we saw significant improvement at the first two time points, improvement at the second and third, but again, we had that outlier, and you can see on the right, you can see the outlier pretty clearly. Abdominal pain improved at every time point significantly. And then the composite scores show significant improvement at every time point um, uh, compared to baseline for, GA, for the externalizing behavior metric. So the autism questionnaires, again, the same 11 participants. We looked at 50 individual ABC questionnaires, 31 SRS questionnaires, and 22 Vineland questionnaires, same statistics. The composite scores for the ABC at baseline and 24 weeks, there was significant improvement, and then baseline at 52 weeks, there was significant improvement. The composite scores for the SRS, not significant from zero to 52 weeks. Significant from zero to uh, tw uh, 24 weeks. And again, you see a lot of improvement initially in some of these scales, and then the, either they don't hold or they don't maintain significance, but a lot of that probably has to do with the small n. And I'll show you in a minute how we know that. The vinyl and adaptive behavior, we measured that at the beginning and at 52 weeks. For the, and the vinyl uh, contains a number of subscales. As a composite score, it did not improve. However, interestingly, one of the subscales is maladaptive behavior, internalizing and externalizing. In this case, if you have a decreased score, you have a decrease in the maladaptive behavior. This, this sort of correlates with the externalizing behavior. So we saw a significant improvement in the internalizing and also externalizing maladaptive behavior subscale of the Vineland. So taken in summary, I used the GI questionnaires here, removing the outliers. So there's a significant improvement at each of the time points. And when we write this up, and we're in the process of doing that now, we'll explain the outlier, and Arthur has the clinical picture of that particular patient. It was truly a non-responding, significantly impacted child. So it's not um, irrational to remove that from consideration here as an outlier. But in general, there's improvement across all time points in all children. For the ABC and SRS, you see improvement um, in the ABC from, 50, from zero to 52 weeks in everybody as a group. The SRS does not improve significantly, and again, that may have to do with one, out, that outlier I think is still included in there. Um, the, ex, the VAVs did not change from zero to 52 weeks, but the externalizing behaviors decreased in um, the cohort for both of the subscales. So since we reported that, we now have added an additional seven patients. So now we have a total of 18 patients that have finished. And what I'm going to show you now is just summary data from zero and 52 weeks for each of the same things we just looked at. For the GI, so this is the original data, group one. And you remember there's not significant difference. We have that one outlier, and, <coughs> excuse me, one outlier. And again, you can see that in the right plot. Group two now is the new seven patients. 
highly significant difference, 0 0.05 for those seven, so they improve significantly from zero to 52 weeks. If you do the composite score now with all 18 patients, including the outlier, significant improvement at 52 weeks. That's for the bowel movement chart questionnaire. If we look at the externalizing behavior questionnaire, there was significance in the original cohort from zero to 52 weeks. The second set, cohort number two, the seven patients, again, significant improvement from zero to, to uh, 52 weeks. You combine those, highly, highly significant improvement in the um, externalizing behavior GI questionnaire between zero and 52 weeks. So this is P of 001. For the Vineland, not significant in the original cohort, and again, maybe due to an outlier. The second cohort, uh, significant in P of 05, when you combine those two, highly, highly significant change in the Vineland Adaptive Behavior Scale. We have not looked at the SRS and the ABC in the second cohort yet. We kind of put this together right before the meeting, so that will be coming and that will be published. But I'd just like to say the, oh, so these are the, 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 this is the summary. The GI questionnaires are the first two sets of plots, and then the VABS is the, the vinyl is the third set. So you have significant improvement in the GI symptoms and signs, and also the autism behaviors as measured by the vinyl at baseline and after 52 weeks of therapy. So, oops. So the take homes, I think, the preliminary results demonstrate that we have a significant improvement in both the GI question, uh, sorry, in both the, the GI symptomology and also autism behavior. All of these scales have subscales that we can drill down and look at. We also have the clinical data across 52 weeks. So if, if we look at those spider plots that were on the right and we say this person got better and then between week 12 and 24, they, got, they, they went the other direction, we might be able to uh, figure out exactly what was going on with that patient at that time point. But you have to understand there's a, a dozen other variables that are interacting here because we're not controlling for age, we're not controlling for what they're eating, we're not controlling for other medications, we're not controlling for any events. We're literally looking at, as they go through their GI treatment course, what happens. Um, and again, so the outcomes vary between the individual, both in the direction and sometimes you have a non-responder. But out of the first 17 or 18, there's only one non-responder, which is pretty remarkable. And uh, again, at the patient, individual patient level, we can get much more granular but for right now, the summary, the take home message is, it looks like that this works in most patients and, and shows significant improvement. So with that, I'll stop. That was shaky. Thanks. That, that was a great overview. And um, one thing, one comment before I get to my question is, uh, I, I always question the importance of the clinical significance. When you have, if you have a situation of a small trial and you have this non, one non-responder and you don't achieve clinical significance, for the patients or the families who did have a significant improvement, for them it's clinically significant, right? So, um, and it's a heterogeneous population, so I, I always question if we're approaching it the right way. That's that's because to me as a clinician, it's, it's really valuable data. I don't worry about that one non-responder, right? I'm, I'm thinking about all these responders. So. Well, right, and then again, Arthur and I talked about this at length last night, and as a treating clinician, he's afraid if you put that up there and somebody's not sure what they're looking at, and they see non-significance as your final conclusion in 52 weeks, like this doesn't work for anybody. When the reality is, that's why we show, when we write this up, I'm going to say exactly that. I'm going to show in the same figure, plot A and plot B, one is having the ally removed. And what that points out is when you have an N of 11, and you actually have, you know, uh, you can't count the number of variables that you're actually uh, looking at, um, or that, that might impact the outcome. Um, having one outlier is actually phenomenally low. And it's explainable. So, but, but it, you know, appearances is everything. So if you look at it, you say no, no change. You like that means nobody got better at all, and that's pretty distressing. And really, it's just one non-responder. So we'll explain it that way. Yeah, and it speaks to the importance of you know finding the right biomarkers and trying to segregate out populations. 
And normally we try to do that a priori before we even set up the trial, but I think it's fair in these situations that if you find the, the differences in that non-responder, it's worth publishing that. If you can find anything that really distinguishes them. That's a good point. Haven't we, again, and, and we didn't go very granular with this just because it's not the appropriate place to do it, but we will definitely look at the non-responder. And he has a whole clinical story that our team will speak to that. Yeah, no, you did. That's, that's absolutely true. <clears throat> and what it really does, it shows you that um, the, the importance of power to study properly. So during the first year, well, we only had 11 patients total, that one non-responder was extreme. Um, he, was, he, had a, he had the worst impaction I've ever seen in my career. Um, I put the scope in, and when I got to the sigmoid, it was a rock. It was a rock. And it was as wide as the colon, and it was distending it. And uh, under anesthesia, I had to manually push the stool down and break it up, pressing the stool against his uh, iliac crest. It was an amazing, and a huge amount of this rock hard stool came out. Now, so he was a non responder, um, but because it, was pow it wasn't powered adequately, that made a difference. But once we added our second year's worth of data, and at the end is 18. Even with that low responder, we still had uh, very significant outcomes. And that's, that's really the, the pay core message, um, is that um, and, and the, way, the way it's presented, obviously, is very important. Uh, but the, once, the, once we have enough patients, the results are clear. And, and what I think was also, it, was, it, it, um, it confirmed what the parents had been saying all along, really. The, the parents always told me, hey, you know, when the GI disease with this medication, these things were happening. And it took me a couple of years to actually believe it because I really wasn't looking to treat autism. I was looking to treat their GI disease. Um, but it turns out that this is one more piece of the larger puzzle of things that can affect the behavior ultimately of the child. So um, the crucial thing is that any of you that are involved in caring for children, even if you don't think, you don't see what you feel to be a GI symptom, even if you think the stool is wrong, or if there are extremes of behavior, if something's changed, then you must think of the GI tract, and you must have it evaluated whether anything else, GI, is wrong or not. I think the behavior could be the only manifestation of an underlying GI disease. Okay, follow up a real quick question. So, uh, yeah, and this sounds crazy, but yesterday we listened uh, uh, to uh, the importance of uh, sleep activated spike wave discharges, and those can be treated with steroids to improve. Uh, sleep is certainly important in GI function, both in terms of motility as well as plays playing a role in inflammation. And this sounds crazy, but how do I know that these patients are not the same as those with the sleep activated discharges and that we're actually treating both? Like, I, I'd love to just see what their EGs look like. I'd love to put a wearable on them and see what their sleep patterns look like. So, I mean, that's great. And that's a fantastic study to do. Um, one thing that came out from this that you probably will notice that during the first 12, during the first 24 weeks, of course, every domain and every group and every, and every cohort you saw that great response. And that's when the parents, and that's when the patient was put on steroids. The way I chose to treat these patients is kind of like the old fashioned way before we had um, drugs like, uh, well, the UMABs that we have now, the biologic agents. Um, steroids are phenomenally useful in these patients because of the inflammatory, underlying inflammatory. Uh, processes that are occurring systemically, body-wide. So when we treated for that, we saw improvement, and I'm sure that you would see, yeah, I'm sure that you would see improvement in seizures and those things, uh, but it would be great to show that. Um, and then the, the improvements, that's why, that's why I insisted on getting a, a weekly GI um, symptom index, because during the course of the year, two years, I'll be changing medications periodically, and, I'll, and I want to see how clinically that turns out when we only it out. I have a question regarding, first I would like to acknowledge the um, um, who are here. A lot of 
uh, as our parents of uh, childhood autism. Um, there are also researchers, scientists, researchers. Um, we'd like to thank everyone for their contribution. At the tail of this conference, we all realize that there is a big connection of the gut-brain axis. Um, if anything, we learned that constipation makes the symptoms worse, inflammation makes things worse. My question is, is there any um, special diet for kids with autism? Since there is this association between inflammation of the gut and possibly systemic inflammation, um, and also response to antibiotics, steroids, when kids have this flare, um, and also like the gluten-free uh, diet, like, like does gluten really cause inflammation in the gut? Um, do, do these kids require to have a colonoscopy and upper endoscopy and biopsies to document uh, inflammation and just follow some special uh, diet? And then how do you treat them when they have this GI symptoms? Uh, you mentioned that there is a kid who had appendicitis. And one thing I learned from this uh, conference too is there is um, 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 that, that autistic kids have also high tolerance for pain. They might have a fever, but they might not tell you they have abdominal pain. And I'm um, impressed about this mother who uh, pushed things because most of us as parents, we have to push for uh, uh, things for our kids. When you go to the pediatrician, um, it seems like we speak different language. Even though I'm a physician, but when I talk about my son, oh, so something is off with him. I really have to advocate uh, for him uh, to get uh, treated. So how can we like, have standardized things as a parent about where to look for diet? Because when I look for diet online for autism, there is no consensus, there is no guidelines. When I try to find probiotics that, for example, are age appropriate, there is none either. So is there any a lot of questions. Um, Sorry. <laughs> okay, that's all right. And um, just just a word about the diet. So there, you know, this that has been a hot topic of debate over the last 20 years I've been involved in this. Um, I'll say from uh, the published papers that are out there, and there are published papers saying that gluten-free, casein-free does make a difference. Others saying it doesn't make a difference. Um, you know, in my opinion, there's a study called the Brit Scan. Uh, British Scandinavian Brit scan study, and I don't remember there's some title uh, like about 12 years ago that I think was the, was the, was the blind and parsnival study, um, and uh, it, showed, it showed a difference. But in my, in my own experience, there are um, many, many, many patients who do better when they when you remove gluten and casein from their diet than many patients who don't. Okay, and I, people don't know why. Um, my suspicion is that, uh, is that like many other GI diseases, uh, it's not just one or two foods, but it's almost any food. If you have a diseased bowel, um, many of the uh, many allergic GI conditions, many inflammatory GI conditions, bowel rest is one of the things that we do for a period of time, meaning that you stay in and you avoid anything in the bowel at all, because anything will irritate an already inflamed and diseased intestine. So some, many of those patients, I have no doubt, can't tolerate any foods. Uh, and there is no test, there's no reliable test to predict you know, what is gonna work with what patient, which, which, what foods to give them, what foods not to give them. Uh, many, many clinicians will use a variety of blood tests and um, I, I have not found them to be useful. Uh, trial and error. It, which is time consuming and very difficult and open to bias is still the only way that I know of to make that decision. As far as your second point of having to push things forward, so one of the things that we um, that we tried to do two days ago on, on Friday, yeah, you might have been there but I don't remember, um, was to, uh, to create a consensus paper on what to do when the patient um, has a change of status, right? And that's, I think, that's the best first step uh, for helping a parent when they go to the ER. 
Yes, David. First of all, good to see you. Good to see you. I'm sorry, I have to tell you. Hi. Thank you both. Wonderful presentation. And um, I, I first want to say, uh, you know, I would endorse everything you just shared. Uh, after years, there is no test. And ultimately, it comes down to parents' best observational skills at knowing what works for their child. Um, and there's no blood test that is the fail safe method for sure. Um, but I just want to share anecdotally that, um, I, as you, this is old news to both of you, that when I uh, treat GI abnormalities in my children, uh, before I send them to you, um, they, those who have seizures, as you already know, they abate. They the, the, the frequency and or the magnitude of these episodes uh, is affected in a positive manner. Um, and this, of course, is not a surprise to both of you, but for those in the room who have children with seizures or know people, that is requisite information to at least share with them. The second thing is, is that, um, although this is clearly in the Bohemian spectrum, uh, when I treat yeast, uh, which I was, of course, not taught in medical school, the number of GI abnormalities also decreased, and probably that has to do with permeability and or you know, metabolites, but it's very interesting, and I, I wanted to share that. So uh, there are people, you know, there is a very select few who, I, when I treat the yeast, uh, I will observe a similar uh, decrease in the frequency, but that's not universal. There are, there are two published papers that I'm using, uh, using hospital discharge codes. Um, they wanted to try, they wanted to find which comorbidities tend to cluster together in patients who have autism. Both studies found that um, autism, that uh, GI disease, uh, GI dysfunction, GI symptoms, and seizures, those two clustered together. So there, there is that connection. We know that there's that connection there in the data, but to show it on the EEG is something that um, I would love to do, you know, so. The other thing is that, you know, we don't need to wait for type one Bristol school formation to consider that these children have altered GI issues. And I find that, and this is hard, it's very hard for my parents to swallow this, but even in the face of quote unquote typical stool formation or frequency, whatever they've gotten used to, they still have to keep their threshold of suspicion extremely low when some kind of altered behavior comes up. There, you have to go to GI first, in my opinion. So, and, and unfortunately, not that they, they're not listening, but it's very hard to really galvanize that conviction in them because it's so pervasive this issue that you're describing. In my population, I continue to hammer, this is a requisite priority you have to see. There is no such thing as self-injurious behavior that just pops up because the stars are alive. Yeah. There is a reason this happens, and it is our ethical duty to be able to, to address this. So, thank you very much. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I want to congratulate uh, Dr. Krixman and Dr. Walker for this work because for a long time, I've been listening to Dr. Pixman give this presentation about GI and improvement in autism symptoms, and finally we've gotten around to gathering the data and also uh, doing the analysis to come to this level of uh, uh, evidence. So, uh, best wishes to continue to no, <laughs> push forward well, and get it. Uh, thanks, thanks to you. <laughs> thanks getting to you. it published. The reason for that this is uh, so important to me is uh, number one is my personal experience. When my son uh, recurs so badly, like literally losing 25 pounds in a very short amount of time and bloody stool when he was 19 years old and we rushed to Dr. Pixman and pushed the steroids and everything else that he had and he was able to come back and give his graduation speech in high school. So that is one uh, you know, evidence that I have that this has to be looked at more seriously. And uh, he also had a grand mal seizure at that time. And then the second um, thing is that this is not dependent on drug discovery. We already have this and what he does is standard of care. And it's just not accessible to all of us. And uh, I, I just want to let you all know that he does come to California, I mean this part of California once in two months. So if any parents want to access treatment he's there. 
so my point is that we are looking for drug discovery in so many areas, but this already exists. So we have to, like Dr. Trevor said, we have to look at it with a um, more uh, suspicious lens when our kids fall apart and there's and we claim that there is no GI problem. So once again, congratulations. For this. Thank you. 